This podcast contains potentially sensitive topics, including strong language, drug abuse, and other conditions of human suffering. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Rex Holbein, and welcome to You Know Me Now, a podcast conversation that strives to amplify the unheard voices in our community. For the past 12 years, I have met and spent a great deal of time with thousands of folks living homeless. Countless life-changing for me conversations and friendships were gained. Through those experiences, I learned how destructive and baseless the dehumanizing effects of the negative stereotype are against ordinary people who are just like you and me. I want to remind all of our listeners that the folks who share here do so with a great deal of vulnerability and courage. They share a common hope that by giving all of us a window into their world, they're opening an increased level of awareness, understanding, and connection within our community. In a world that is ever more complex, our relationship to it is increasingly being simplified. We are living in an age of information overload. There is not enough time to consume, verify, uh, digest, and form an opinion on everything being presented. So we take shortcuts. In the rush of daily life, it's easy to dive less deep so that we can cover more area, hoping to know a little about a lot. Sound bites and stereotypes work their way into our understanding and beliefs of the world around us. These shortcuts have a big downside. Without a genuine understanding of an issue, one that includes differing views, we are susceptible to the polarization and, quite frankly, dehumanization that occurs within the us versus them mentality. Taking time to understand the complexity of an issue the gray areas, the sticking points between opposing views isn't a battle for winning, but rather an opportunity for understanding. To be on this journey of understanding, we need to listen, specifically to those with lived experiences around the issue being discussed. Today, we're going to hear about drug addiction. As vast and complex as this topic is, chances are you already have strong opinions based on past experiences. Perhaps you've had a bicycle stolen and you're sure it was taken by someone addicted looking to sell it for their next fix. You negatively refer to that unknown person as a junkie. It becomes your opinion of the drug issue. Perhaps your sister overdosed and died. As a result, your parents couldn't find a way to emotionally support each other, so they divorced. The grief was too great. And because of it, you're angry at anyone who takes drugs. Or perhaps you are addicted yourself and have burned every relationship you've ever had, including those in your family. You feel lonely and isolated. You believe nobody cares. Every person that has been touched by drug addiction, either personally or through a friendship, a close one or even a brief encounter, has strong visceral feelings about this issue. Feelings that are accompanied with endless questions, most of which are difficult, emotional, and often unanswered. To find the answers, we need to get past the sound bites and stereotypes. We all, need to dive deeper. In this episode, we're going to hear from the Miller family. The Millers live on Lopez Island, a beautiful, sleepy, and idyllic place located in the San Juan Islands in the northwest corner of Washington State. To get there, you have to take a ferry. One of the endearing customs on the island is that every car driver I mean every single car driver, when passing another driver in the opposite direction, waves to each other. That should be enough to give you an idea of how quaint the place is. 
Connell's parents, Steve and Mary, had graciously invited me over. Connell's older sisters, Bridie and Katie, who have their own families and live on Lopez Island, also came over to share in the discussion. Before we listen to the Millers, let me first tell you how I met Connell Miller. It was in the fall of 2018. I was visiting folks living in tents along the Ship Canal in the Fremont neighborhood in Seattle. When I arrived at Doc and Aaron's usual spot by the water's edge, standing outside of the tent, I asked out loud if they were home. At first there was nothing, no reply. A few moments later, I heard a rustle, and then the tent flap unzipped. A young man poked his head out and politely told me that Doc and Aaron had left earlier. He offered to tell them that I had stopped by, and he said his name was Connell. My first thought was how very young he looked. Despite the sores on his face from doing drugs, I had this immediate feeling that he wasn't supposed to be out here. Not that anyone is supposed to be out living homeless, addicted to drugs, but there was this easily felt innocence to him. We talked for a good while and struck up an almost immediate connection. We traded phone numbers and promised to get together again sometime soon. To start things off, I asked Connell to tell me a bit about his childhood. My parents are uh, awesome. You know, I grew up in um, the church. We had a home church. Uh, you know, my dad's a pastor. A lot of the pastor's kids I've known and a lot of the, you know, the congregation families and stuff. I've ha heard a lot of like horror stories or, you know, just growing up with tons of, con you know, really controlling environment. And um, my situation was the opposite. My mom likes to say uh, we were free range children. I, I grew up camping. I was homeschooled. Um, like I had two older sisters. I was the youngest by far. My parents had me at 43 and 46. And so my sisters were eight and 10 years older than me. I, I loved fishing. Um, by the time I was, I think it was six or seven, my sisters were going to punk shows and indie shows in Seattle. And so they, from probably six or seven to 12 or 13, they took me to shows in Seattle all the time. I was around all their friends. Uh, so yeah, it was um, a really solid upbringing. Several weeks ago, I met with the Millers at their small home on Lopez Island. I asked Mary and Steve to share some insight into Connell's early years. Um, I ended up as actually a barren woman. They told me I could never have children. From the time we got married, I wanted a baby. It was 11 years until my first child was born, and I wanted one every month. That I was disappointed every month. And uh, after, when I was 31, I had our first daughter, which was a miracle. No chance this was ever going to happen. And then, surprise, two years later, another little girl. And they were um, so wanted, and we had had so much time to think about how in the heck we're going to raise these kids that we were really intentional. And we had we had, had 25 foster kids and uh, had raised them and made mistakes and learned a lot. Since they were both such amazing miracles, we never expected it to happen again. But 10 years later, guess what happened? We had another surprise. He was a delight. He was a boy. When Connell, when I was praying with Connell, they had ultrasounds, and they asked if I wanted to know, and we found out he was a boy, and we were over the moon. I remember I went to where Steve works, and he didn't know. He, his surprise was so huge, he started crying. He's gonna have a baby boy. And um, boy, he was, he was wanted, and he was a delight, and he was smart and uh, he, he was everything that we could have wanted. Having had 25 foster kids and two little girls that were 10 and 8, we really felt like there was nothing that was going to come up that we weren't prepared to handle. I remember somebody said, what if you have one of those kind of kids? And I thought, no problem. So he grew up, when it, he grew up in a home that, was, that Mary talked about was, we were active really active. She more than me, I was working. Because one of the deals we made early on, and I know this is going to sound crazy to people, but, but uh, it actually works, that I would work, I would provide the roof, clothes, moral support, emotional support, 
love, um, Mary would not go out. Some people have to, you have to have two incomes. But we were able to make it with one. Uh, we, weren't, we didn't live fancy, we had a nice home and all that. And she was there, so that's why the house was so active, because she's, she's really an active person and loves to be around people. Probably, I would say an average of three nights a week of his growing years, um, we were counseling people in our home. The kids grew up around that atmosphere, you know, constantly, why do we think the way we think? Uh, what direction am I going and why? Uh, why did I make this decision concerning this? And we're, we're counseling with, with uh, almost always adults couples that are having difficulties in their in their marriage. We were kind of fat, dumb, and happy because the girls were just a piece of cake. So what we had planned was, we, it's called parenting on purpose. You know, we had a plan. Uh, we had decided that what we're doing now, what we do with Bridie and Katie, is not working with Connell. So what we came down to was, was let's provide a large enough corral that he's got room to roam. It was give him a big enough area where we have guards that he doesn't know about out far enough. And in that, just, just physical space, he had freedom of our neighborhood, but our neighborhood was a little bit different. Than, it's not, it wasn't like a city neighborhood. There was fish, there was woods, there was deer. He'd, he'd fish anywhere there was water, and he caught fish, he, which is familiar with my childhood, where actually we were more free range. I did, when he was a kid, I, I, I did the same stuff when I was a kid. So I'd see him out catching lizards or snakes or fishing or those things, exploring. And it reminded me so much of my own child. It's the same. I mean, it, it's, we used to catch snakes together. The two girls, Bridie and Katie, were so easy to raise. I thought it was our parenting and our experience. I didn't realize that some kids naturally want to be parented and want, want to do what makes other people happy. And for some, there's an obstructionist in them that no matter what you try, they're going to find a way around it. Uh, you can imagine, with all of our experience, how many kind of things we tried to make his life better. And it, it was an uphill battle. So one time, uh, he, we were building a garage, and we were outside, and Connell was out with us, and he decided he wasn't going to do whatever it was that I wanted. And um, so I reached over and gave him a little encouragement on the bottom. And he decided that, that, that I was wrong, that that wasn't going to happen. And he fell down on the ground in the dust and the dirt. And he was crying and fighting. And, and I was trying to figure out how to handle this little thing that was happening. And I finally got him picked up and took him in the house and put him in the bathtub because he was just beside himself. And um, I think Steve had to come in. And uh, afterwards, Steve was drying him off and holding, he'd calm down. He looked at me like, there's no way you're going to win this battle. No way. And Steve cleaned him up and dried him off. And he said, son, look at this doesn't work. This is not good. This, this, you didn't win. And he said, oh, yes, I did. You had to come in. As the years went on, Connell was having a harder and harder time. He knew he had this great family. He saw them doing well, being happy, and flourishing. All the while, he was feeling more and more like he was on the outside of it, like the black sheep. Perhaps it was undiagnosed depression or a rebellion phase, but the short of it was, he was having a hard time feeling like he fit in. So a lot of it was like I was starting to go through my um, my like rebellion phase, but I didn't have anything to rebel against. And so, um, cause I mean, my folks were awesome. So I, I was starting to wish that they were terrible parents or that I had a reason because I had all this angst and stuff. I started like hating myself or, or I don't know. It was, I think there's like hereditary depression in the family. Um, I mean, I know there is. And so all the, around the time all that started and, uh, I was like emo, and it was like when I was 15, uh, started believing the negative thoughts. During this time, one of Connell's friends offered him some weed. On numerous occasions, he turned it down until one day he caved. It was a pivotal moment for Connell. Almost immediately, he felt relief from the stress he carried constantly. He found that the weed 
helped him cope with his teenage angst, which included his schoolwork. In general, it gave him a certain confidence to, to just be himself. One of the times I just, you know, I, I, was, I felt miser miserable about, about like my schoolwork. I couldn't, um, couldn't do math very well. And like, I, uh, I was just like miserable with that and like hating myself. And uh, I was like feeling like if I'm gonna be miserable anyways, you know, because I had a huge conviction not to do it. And, um, and I kind of just like, started like pushing that conviction away. And, and then I, and I, like the first time I smoked weed, like it just, all of that went away, you know? And so, and really quickly it became like, if, if we, you know, if weed feels this good, like what can, you know, how does this feel or how does that feel? And as, as I was still, you know, as I was smoking and, and partying and stuff, like I still have this major, like, pangs of like conviction like I don't know if it was God or if it was just my you know like my inner self like saying like what are you doing dude don't do this you know better you know better and I would like I felt like I would like physically like push it down it was like full blown after that I think I was, by the time I was 17 I was starting to do coke all the time and then Oxycontin you know after I stopped getting that conviction and, and stuff it was just um, like a yard sale like everything went Connell was beginning to separate emotionally, living two lives. For the most part, this disconnect remained hidden from the family. Well, most of the family. His oldest sister, Bridie, was on to him. She had noticed early on how Connell was able to manipulate their parents. I knew right away that he was the expert at the long con, like from the time he was 18 months. And so I was on him about the long con because I could read his mind about it, man. I just knew. And nobody else believed me or knew. Katie, mom and dad, none of them believed that Connell was the expert at long con. And I was like, you're doing the thing. And when it was just him and I. And long con is basically just he had a long game that he was playing. Oh, about everything all the time. And um, he would think you know, something like, I don't want to do chores or I want to go to a friend's house or whatever he would think. And he wouldn't even know what the end game was. He'd be like, I'm just going to set this up. So whatever the end game ends up being, I'm ready for it, you know. And he just told me all through the years, you're the only one who sees it. But he would tell me without them listening. So when he started using, I knew. I just knew. And I was like, you're doing the thing. And what I didn't realize is his long con had gotten exacerbated by drugs. And he had gotten cruel to me behind my back. I knew what was going on and I would confront him with it, but because of the drugs, he had gotten cruel and he knew, he knew I, was, um, I was his weakness because I knew the truth. He was, you were onto him. And I was getting talked to kindly and gently by my mom and sister about maybe having a hard heart towards Connell or maybe not seeing him for giving him the benefit of the doubt. And I think for me, it really came to a head when he stole my cell phone and I knew he'd stolen my cell phone and I told mom and dad he stole my cell phone and they said there's no way he did that and he <laughs> butt dialed our my parents home phone from the caller ID of my cell phone and then talked to his friends laughing about how he'd stolen my cell phone and nobody was gonna believe me busted right so that's when I was like okay finally retribution they're gonna get it they're gonna see they're gonna understand and during this whole time, Connell was saying, I was confronting him, like, are you, what's going on? Are you, and he'd be like, I don't know why I do it. I'm so sorry. Um, so my mom and dad, he told them it was a joke and they believed him. Then I was like, oh, even mature, kind, intelligent people can fall into the trap of denial and enabling. So that was a rough few years. And I wasn't mad at Connell. I never got mad at Connell. I was always trying to figure out um, how to, bring those two sides together the the intelligent boy that i could get to talk to me in reality and then the long con kid who had so many lies out there there was no way to there he didn't feel i could tell you could tell by his eyes he didn't feel like there was a there was a way out and every relationship started dying and he got more and more trapped and um when everybody finally realized that he was an addict, um, I wasn't horrified or surprised, I'd already known. I asked Connell about this duality, about how on one hand he had this solid family unit, people who loved him and believed in him, and on the other hand he was rebelling and undermining his relationships 
while spiraling deeper into drug use. Growing up with my, my family around me and they were so happy and so great and they, it, everything was really, I think it, it felt like it came really easy for them, like both my sisters. I mean, not easy for them, like they got handed anything, but like just joy and, you know, going through life with things working out internally. Like I saw that and uh, I didn't feel like I had that, like, and they were, they were so great and I just felt so bad. So I think that's where that came from is like, I just felt like uh, that I wasn't good, you know? And uh, seeing uh, the people in my life and my family and everything. And I, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to feel that way. And I, there was times when I did, but yeah, it was, I, I you know, it was kind of like, I didn't realize it. I mean, I didn't see it like this at the time, but I felt like, like the black sheep. I started to believe that big time you know, hating myself. And, and um, I think what a lot of times people will do when they feel that way is uh, uh, they want to abuse themselves or they want to, you know, find something that like, you know, they can beat themselves up with. And that's, that's where I started really get, you know, get into drug use and stuff. I thought he was an extrovert. He was so personable and happy. People loved him, shared all his toys. Everything happened at our house. Uh, we had church at our house, we had a uh, choir at our house, we had piano lessons at our house. Everybody came to our house. And he was well-loved by the kids. The parents kind of ha- looked at him like they thought maybe we weren't parenting him enough. But we really felt like we had tried everything we knew to do, and the best thing was to give him as much freedom as we could within parameters. And we kept thinking it was going to be okay. His sisters loved him, and his friends loved him, and he knew he was loved, and he was well loved. I mean, I remember I was, I had been smoking weed and stuff, and I think I was like 16, and I started calling people I knew, asking for heroin, and I'd never even, I mean, I'd just barely done pills, and like, my friends at the time, even though they were getting high and stuff, they were like, what are you doing, Connell? Like, don't, don't do heroin, man. You're six, like, are you crazy? Like. Like I had friends that were that were definitely living crazy lifestyle and did coke and stuff. Like, give me an intervention because they knew I was looking for heroin. And they I mean they weren't like that was too far. Yeah, totally. And so, um, it, it was just I definitely went. I was just trying to do uh, do my do myself the worst, I guess. I mean, it was just you know it was like the two halves of me, knowing I was doing the wrong thing and knowing. I deserve better and I, I, I want better, but then there was the, well, you know, the other half of me that was just, um, there's a analogy or a, it's a story that conveys a meaning. Uh, it's about like, there's two, two dogs, you know, a good dog and a bad dog and whichever one you feed more is going to get stronger. And so, um, it was, and another saying I, I like is small foxes spoil the vine. And it was so you just, the little things you let yourself get away with eventually lead to big things or you know they eventually take over and so it was just a a process of chipping away you know me chipping away at myself yeah so it it was definitely didn't happen overnight it was a it was a process over quite a few years do you think that if you didn't feel like the black sheep or didn't feel envious or you know of wanting that joy that you saw in your other family members, that you would have gone down the drug path. Do you think? Do you think that is is that putting the finger on it in some way for you? Um, yeah, I think that I think that I wouldn't have um, been seeking uh, people on the other side of it. I mean, because I had to go and find those kind of people. You know, I like I. That, you know that that we're using and stuff, and um, so yeah, I, I I don't think I would have um, I would have gotten there, but you know, who knows? I have thought about the things that we've done wrong all this time, and tried to say, okay, I don't hate myself for it, but if we could do it again, or if somebody else was going to do it, what would I do different? And one of the things is maybe if he was in grade school. The teachers would have seen something and would have recommended a, some kind of diagnosis or treatment or something. As opposed to homeschooling. As opposed to homeschooling, yeah. So 
that's one of the things that I wonder. No, we really felt like there was a place for everybody and that most people get put into a box if they go to school and that he would definitely probably be put in a box and his best place was outside, like Connell said, free-ranging. It sounds like that you both loved uh, Connell and your children and, and you were figuring it out like all parents have to figure it out, right? You know, like I, I remember back when we went, you know, brought our first daughter home and you leave the hospital and you put him in the, in the car seat and you drive away and your overwhelming feeling is, we know nothing and they're letting us leave with this little human? You know, it's kind of like, what the? Something feels wrong about this. But, you know, you make do, you learn, uh, you learn by, by doing. And I, I think what I'm hearing from you is you raised Connell with love and, and a desire to parent. We accepted him the way he was more than anyone else. Uh, the other parents thought we needed to discipline him. And we had tried discipline at an early age and it was, it, it didn't work. So we, we were trying to make it work with what we had and maybe we made a mistake that way, but you look at what you did wrong after, at this point and forgive yourself. Because we all make terrible mistakes. Like you said, you brought that baby home. You shouldn't have been left with that baby. You didn't know what you were doing. And we make mistakes. And every parent that I know that's been where I am struggles with, did, were we tough enough? Did we use tough love? Did Or were we too accommodating? Did we spoil them? I mean, you just, you do it all when you have. You can second guess everything. And then, and then you have to come to a point where, well, it happened and I'm not going to. I'm not going to stay there because that's not healthy. As the years went on, Connell continued to experiment with heavier and heavier drugs. His relationship with his family was deteriorating further and further, faster and faster. There was a group of friends I'd hang out with, and I think I tried ecstasy. was like the next thing I tried, and then mushrooms not long after that. Um, and so I just did like party drugs like that and I went through like a hallucinogens phase and acid and after and after that I stopped I stopped struggling with the self-loathing and stuff so much like having a ton of fun partying and and get like the people you know the friends I was hanging out with they weren't messed up people they were just getting having fun and getting high too and um for a while like during using hallucinogens I was having a lot of uh, epiphanies about stuff and I feel like it at times it was really helping me, you know, have self-realizations and connect with people and there, it wasn't always bad. And I was still live with my parents at this time. I mean, I think I got kicked out, I think two or three times, um, but I, you know, would be gone for a couple months and I'd come back. Kicked out by your parents, parents yeah. because they found that no, you were... No, they, well, I, I, I always fought with my mom about homeschooling, about just ever since I was really little, I was, I... There was like an age-old battle between us, and um, you know, and we loved each other. Really, I, I loved my both my parents loved me, and I love them. But like during those rebellion phase and everything, they were really trying the whole time, and I, I would just fight and fight and fight. You guys were just button heads. Yeah, I don't know what they could have done different. I don't think there's anything that could, they could have done to stop. You know, that would have stopped me from, you know, taking the path that I did. I asked Connell about how his addiction progressed. What were the stair steps for moving from one drug to the next? I don't know if it was that linear. I think there were kind of phases. I, don't, I actually don't know exactly the time frame that I started, you know, using heavier stuff. Um, I know when I was 17, almost 18, I started hanging out with my friend Danny and he sold Coke and he was like not much older than me. And um, I think I, I met him through buying ecstasy from, from a guy, Josh. And then I started hanging out with them. And uh, I started driving Danny around to sell coke. And he was giving it to me to drive him. And then he went to jail. I dropped him off somewhere really quick. And he, he left, I think, almost a quarter pound of coke in my glove box. And so I started selling it. And I mean, I was like, I wasn't the type to sell coke, you know what I mean? Uh, I was still like a teenager, uh, just a nice, you know, 
using, but just a nice kid, you know? So I had to bring the money to his dealer's house, and then I just, thats I think that's where I started using OxyContin. When you, when you crossed over to actually going back and bringing money from selling Coke to the drug dealer, that feels like a moment. Like that feels like a moment like where, where the little voice inside would say, oh, this just went up a notch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Do you remember, did you have a conversation with yourself or did it just, was it all just part of the same, just one day to the next? It was, yeah, it was, I mean, because I'd been driving Danny around for a while and I guess the addiction voice had really taken over because I was like, oh, if I can, you know, you know, Danny went to jail, I have, if I go sell this, now I can get in with the dealer and be closer to the, you know, that the stuff. And I guess it was kind of, I don't want to like mean to want to bring race into it, but I, I felt kind of like I'm just this little white kid hanging out with these, you know, it's an Italian and native and, and black drug dealers that, I mean, they were pretty badass dudes. Like not, I mean, not like badass, like cool, but like there were, there were some badasses, you know, that, and they all accepted me. And so I felt like, you know, I was in with the badass, good, cool crowd, you know. And therefore you were badass. Yeah. One of the many statements parents share is that they didn't know their child had gotten into drugs. They had completely missed it until the addiction was in full swing. I asked Mary when she figured out that Connell was using drugs. I can't believe it since uh, Steve and I also had gone through rehab in uh, 72. I can't believe that we missed it. But um, we did, and um, it wasn't until his burn, uh, when the house caught on fire and uh, he was put into Harborview, it was all in front of me, and I should have seen it. But I know it's not until uh, the nurse accidentally let it slip that um, he was a junkie. I mean, it was devastating. I asked Connell if he could share the memory of that moment. It was right after my birthday. Um, I was living at my parents' house. They had a garage that I, we turned into a little apartment for me. I was I was renting that from them, and I was using in there. And uh, I was having a friend stay there that he didn't. He just smoked weed. He didn't use. You know, he knew I was using and stuff, and he didn't like it. But um, we were making dinner one night. We, we we were we had like chicken nuggets or chicken strips and fries or something, and. Um, uh, he wanted to do it in the oven, and I said, no, we used, we deep fried it last night, let's just use the oil that's still on the stove. And um, he said, all right, and, and he, you know, he starts the oil, and I take a shower, and then go downstairs and smoke some weed on the couch with him in my little garage apartment, and then we both looked at each other and realized that oil was still hot on the stove. And we ran upstairs, and it was a fire from the stove to the ceiling, like raging fire out of this pot. And I take my towel that I had taken a shower with and I tried to throw it over it and I slipped, hit the handle of the pot and poured it down my whole back and arms and legs. 30% of my body got third degree burns. It was a oh nightmare. Oh my God. Yeah. And my mom and mom and dad were in the their bedroom down the hall and they heard the crash and the scream and me and I, I jumped up off the floor and like my whole, I, I mean, I have eight skin grafts. It was, it was really, really, really bad. Uh, the, th the thing is, is that the burn, like, it was so deep and so, you know, flaming canola oil uh, that most of my nerves got burnt pretty fast, except for my hands. So uh, my hands hurt so, so it felt like they were throbbing like the size of school buses or something. It, it was, it was, and so I had like my hands in a little pot of water to like relieve the pain and the ambul ambulance showed up. And um, I remember trying to walk down the stairs to my room to get my dope. That because I like I didn't want my parents to find it and I wanted it I wanted it at the hospital like that's like I'm like a burn victim still trying to like make sure I have my stuff uh, so I go to the hospital and I'm there I'm there for about a month in the burn unit and they said I healed faster than most people I'd seen so I should have been there over a month um, and I was pumped full of opiates there like I mean uh, Dilaudid methadone, um, fentanyl lollipops for when I got sloughed. And uh, so that was pretty crazy. My parents and my parents were there the whole time by my side, but um, I had told the paramedics that, you know, they when they went to put me on a drip in the in the helicopter, because um, so I got 
airlifted to Harborview, uh, they saw all the track marks on my arm. And I'd been wearing long sleeves all the time so my family wouldn't see it. And um, he's like, what's this? And I told him I'm, you know, I'm a heroin addict. Um, and so they, that was on my, my file at the hospital. And so uh, the doctors assumed that my family knew and, you know, div kind of divulged that I was a heroin addict and they, did, they had no idea. Um, I had been living with them and just, and so they cleaned my room out and I had like needles stashed um, and I mean in cups and you know, under the TV and everywhere throughout the room. And so that's like right about two days before I was going to be discharged, I got an intervention from the whole family. And they, they hadn't, they had known for a week or two or something that I, while, while they were with me in the hospital, um, but they didn't say anything. And so it was really blindside. Like, I, th I thought I was still good to go. They didn't know. But um, the, you know, my covers were pulled. We had um, a, a foster granddaughter who had done interventions and had also been intervened. And um, we asked her. And in our mind, she was a part of the family. In Connell's mind, he hardly knew her. So we asked her about it, and she came. You know, it's a big deal to leave the island and to go into the Harborview and, and sit around, and we asked Connell to come in. And, and honestly, it, the powerlessness is the overwhelming feeling. You, you named it. To sit there, and he, you could tell he was as closed as a brick wall. He was not gonna open. And each of us said something, his brother-in-laws, his sisters, me and and uh, this granddaughter and and have tried everything we knew to appeal to his heart and it was just just solid wall of nothing and he finally said okay yeah okay I'll do it I'll do it but we we didn't expect him to really and but we were on pins and needles waiting to find out and when he we called the next day to he was gone he had checked himself out Interventions are really hard to do. Emotionally exhausting for everyone involved. I can speak from experience because our family did one for my father in regards to alcohol. And I can tell you that often families pour love into someone experiencing addiction while not knowing if they are felt or heard. I asked Connell if during the intervention he was hearing his family or if he was completely closed down. Um, I, I was completely closed down. I, I mean, I think it was, it was a major pride, pride thing. Like not, not like, like ne the negative pride. Like, uh, I felt embarrassed and I felt just, uh, completely like naked, you know, like, um, that side of me was angry. They gave me the intervention and, and they said, you know, there's an ultimatum, you know, you need to check into a year-long inpatient program and start trying to get better and um i was i was really like just closed the whole you know in more like internally i was closed the whole and just angry the whole um intervention not necessarily angry at them but angry that you had been found exactly yeah they were doing the right thing totally the right thing they they loved me to death you know and they i mean they told me people who do who do this die Jails, death, or institutions, you know? Like, I, I mean, I know that they love me, and I know, and they were, and they were expressing that. Like, they were saying, like, we love you so much. We, we're sorry that, you know, you've gotten to this point where you feel like you need to do this to yourself, and, you know, we don't know what we did wrong, and we want to help you. I think it was, I was just um, doing whatever I could to protect my drug use, you know what I mean? And so I told him, uh, I told him, yeah, I'll do the treatment, totally, you know, sign me up. And then I checked out the day before I was supposed to do it and then just ghosted them. I know that, I, I, I would say yes, I felt it, but I was I was like deflecting that because, you know, to, to uh, give into it and to accept it, that would uh, trigger me saying yes and actually going to treatment. And uh, my drug side was like full on fight or flight, you know what I mean? You know, sometimes I guess people just aren't ready. That was 2010, beginning of October, midway through October 2010. And um, I left and I 
stayed at a friend's house a little bit and you know a week or two because I had the prescription from the hospital so I was sharing that with them and trying to take care of my burn wounds and uh yeah it was crazy um I, I mean the it was the pain in, at, during the healing was worse than the pain when it happened Connell left the hospital and was staying with a friend he had no real plans his addiction at this point was in complete control meaning he was completely out of control so the friends I was staying at he had like a little like a bedroom made in a kind of a shed outbuilding kind of thing. Me and another person had gone and got some heroin and I had lost what my part of it. And so I found what I thought was the heroin and I put it in a spoon and started to cook it up. And I think it was like a piece of Taco Bell meat. No, I think I was just so desperate. I was like, is this it? And I picked it up and I, you know, was gonna like see if it cooked in the spoon. I don't even why I didn't just taste it because you can tell. And I was like, I think this is it. and his mom walks in and sees me and so she's like what's what are you doing and you know it's obvious and it, it's funny because i wasn't even i don't think think it was drugs at all but i got kicked out and yeah, uh, for taco bell meat yeah <laughs> so ridiculous man i was an idiot uh that afternoon i got dropped off in downtown marysville state street by someone and i i didn't know anybody around there and i just started walking and i was like i had run out of my pills and i was so I was dope sick. I was still in pain from the burn, uh, you know, the skin grafts and everything. And I'm like limping at like the slowest you can walk. Like I was like a zombie going down State Street. And um, uh, I think I remembered I knew I had a friend who lived with his mom and his mom's boyfriend and they were all tweakers. And I sat in front of their house until I saw Brad show up. And then I hung out there for a while and. I basically was just on the street. Connell got his car back from his parents and transferred the registration to his name and started to use it as housing in and around Marysville. Got $27,000 in tickets in, my, in that car, living in my car with no insurance, no tabs, a, in a suspended license. And they, I was always really respectful to police when I get pulled over, so they would, they would, give, they would take me out of the car do a field booking, which is uh, read your rights and then let you go with a ticket and um, and then just say, we're gonna leave, you know. So what I'd be like, what do I do about my car? And they'd just say, we're just gonna leave. We don't care what, you know, don't drive it. I eventually had to take my, like my, something wrong with my oil, my oil filter, I had to change, but and I had all these tickets and I was kept on getting in trouble. And so uh, I took my car to pull apart and sold it for like 500 bucks probably would have ran for another hundred thousand miles but I just I was gonna keep on getting in trouble if I didn't get rid of it so I sold it and then the next day had my first major overdose you know I would have been completely blue and my friend was giving me CPR for 15 minutes not and I wasn't responding but he did it the whole time and then the uh, ambulance got there and they narcan me and I came, I came back and my friend's mom was like screaming like crying like that because they thought I, would, I had died I was, I did, had to be carried down the, they had switch back stairs up into his like loft room. Um, I was, I, I woke up being carried on a, a body bag because a gurney couldn't get me down the switch back stairs. While Connell was lost in his journey of addiction, his family was also on a journey, working through the complex emotions felt by those close to the addict. They were searching for understanding, insights, direction, and mostly acceptance for what was taking place within their family. I asked Bridie and Katie to share with us what this journey looks like for them. My family and I would joke because when I would see somebody who was what I would call old school homeless, like clearly a Vietnam vet, or it would warm my heart. Like, oh yeah, there's a real homeless person. And then when I'd see young people who are clearly in addiction, I would just get so frustrated. Like, you probably have a place to go. You probably have people that love you. You just have to make the decision. But since he's been home and I've worked through some of that anger, I did, it wasn't conscious. It wasn't a, a choice to work through it. But I have such a tender spot now for anybody I see who's on the streets. Um, and you know, we've we've been able to interact, me and the kids have been able to interact with people that are on the streets. 
And there's been a complete transformation inside me about it. And I wouldn't say that I have opinions or an action plan or what I think they should do. Um, I just hope that they can make a choice within, within themselves and know that they do have a choice. Um, I, I don't really have the, the pity gene. So for me, when I think of people in addiction or people that are homeless, which are two, in my head, two different groups, I think there's as many people in nice houses with nice cars addicted to pain pills than there are people addicted to street drugs. I actually blame people who are addicted to pain pills in nice houses for the people that are addicted to street drugs. A few years ago, there was a, a bunch of overdoses in the San Juans, which nobody knew we even had heroin in the San Juans. They were so blind. Um, so there was a fentanyl heroin mix that was killing people as soon as the needle would touch their arm. So there was a town hall meeting. One of a, a Lopez loved young man died. So people lost their minds, had a town meeting. The police were there. The sheriff was there. The drug rehab group was there. And people were all blaming whatever, blaming racial groups, blaming certain people. Let's find out who they are. Let's get their names. Let's get them off the island. And I was so overcome with disgust that I stood up and said, all of you that have not counted your oxycodone, all of you who keep getting refills that don't need them, who have no idea that your grandkids are in your cabinets, all of you who don't look at your kids' backpacks, this is your fault. You know, that's my overwhelming feeling about addiction, is that it's the fault of maybe pharmaceutical companies, but we, I can't hold them responsible. I'm not a person in that role, but um, I, can, I myself can be careful of pain pill addiction and count the pills I do have. So the addiction thing, especially for Connell's generation and younger, they, I believe they were damaged. They were hurt. They were wounded unfairly by the culture. Mm -hmm. Big pharma. Yes, 100%. So I do believe they're, they are victims. Even though I don't have pity for people, I do feel like in a lot of situations there's, there's ways and places to get help. But I want to say that with a caveat that I live on Lopez. I don't live in Seattle anymore. I don't, I'm not living in the problem. So I do know from watching us go through it with Connell, and we have he could name 100 people right now that he grew up with that loved him, that he burned all those bridges. So... There aren't people for those, you know, 20 to 35 year olds to go back to. They've burned their bridges. Connell spent the next year living homeless on the streets of Marysville, floating without any real connections. He does remember New Year's Eve 2012 when, out of desperation, he called Sharon, who was like an adopted sister to him. Sharon was someone I'd call while I was out there. She'd come and brought me uh, blankets a couple times and it was, I was sleeping outside, I had no blanket, it was freezing, I, um, it had rained and I was soaking wet and I was completely sick and I was just rock bottom. I mean, it was winter, you know, slept on concrete at Safeway and I finally, I finally broke down and said, I'm ready to do something. They took me to the Union Gospel Mission in uh, Seattle, downtown Seattle, the one, you know, the one on... Yep, on 2nd. Uh-huh, Pioneer Square. Yep. It's a pretty rough area in Pioneer Square. Uh, it was there was the soup kitchen down there, and it was a, uh, a line around the building of people who had been out there a little bit longer than I had. And uh, I mean, it was pretty freaky going in those doors. But I got in there, and I met um, Peter Hansen, who's my, who is um, the case manager of the intake dorm, like the intake floor, where you know you do your month of blackout there. And there's different phases where after you, after a month of blackout, you you can become an orange badge, and you can go. With a, with a battle buddy, they're called, and you can go out and uh, go meetings and go and take around town, and you just have to have the battle buddy, and you can go go walk around Seattle and have fun and, and stuff. And uh, I, I relapsed after a month and a half or so there, and then I was on the cots downstairs for a month. And then I joined the program. You know, I got back in. I graduated in 2013. And so that year in the, in the UGM was amazing. I skated every day. We did, you know, I programmed. Um, we, I worked in the kitchen for a while at the UGM. I stayed clean the whole year, and I learned a ton about myself. And I, and we did a 12-step program in there. I did AA meetings, and I got back in touch with my family, and um, it was awesome. I 
you know, I don't, if I, I don't think if I had, if I hadn't learned everything I learned in there, I don't think I would have made it. Connell graduated from the program at UGM, but was not out of the woods, far from it. He admits that he should have gone back home to his family like they had begged him, but Connell had met a girl. I shouldn't have had a relationship. It was, um, I needed to focus on my sobriety and, you know, she asked me to move in with her and her parents and I just, you know, I did. They were in Bellevue and it was the stupidest decision. I should have gone home to my parents, my parents like I was supposed to and gotten a job and just kept on doing good, but it just led down to me choosing to relapse, choosing, you know, I, I ignored all the signs of, you know, the pre-relapse kind of stuff that, like the small foxes boil the vine stuff, you know, where just letting myself get away with more and more things that are real red flags. And um, it didn't take long for me to start doing heroin again. Soon after Connell got arrested and spent 19 days in jail, charges were dropped and he was let out when the police arrested the real perpetrator of the crime. However, his drug use was once again spiraling out of control. He was able to stay with family friends in Marysville, and while there, he OD'd again. It was a really bad overdose. I, and I mean, they had a, they had a new a newborn baby, and um, like he came out of the living. I was sleeping on the couch, and he came out of the living room, and I was like in my underwear, like crump, like with my leg off one way and my arm off the other way, and completely unconscious. And they took me to the hospital. And I woke up in the hospital like. It was really, really bad. So I get taken to Lopez with my, my family after that. I, st I mean, and I immediately started sneaking pills for my parents again. And it was just, I went right back into that. And I started fighting with my mom again. And, you know, it was about a month of that or so. And she said, they said, my mom said, I can't, we can't do it anymore. And uh, so I went to Orcas where I knew a girl. And I started living with her. And this was in, you know, through... Then 2014, 15, and 16, I was on Orcas and I had gotten almost clean. I was on methadone and I was working and I started to build myself back up. Um, but there was a really good like year and a half or so of, of us being together and working and I started getting close with my parents again. And, and then I just kind of, right when I was about to get off of the methadone, like just weaning off of that last five milligrams a day, I started using heroin again because I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't make it. <laughs> what a beast. Yeah, it's crazy, you know. Just keeps coming back. Yep, and ta ta I mean, taking everything and, and me, well, not taking, me giving everything to it, you know, it's, it's a choice, really. I mean, I just didn't have the resolve. I left the island, I'd go and try and get better. Um, I went to Bellingham and I tried, and I did this Suboxone taper program for a week, I think, or 10 days. I guess Suboxone makes you sick longer than heroin, and and so when I got out, I was I went I got finally got to the UGM, and off you know I didn't have any Suboxone or anything or and I was sick for like two and a half three weeks, in the program, dope sick, I ended up relapsing in there, because that sick feeling wouldn't have got, wouldn't go away and when heroin is like five ten days tops and it was just sick for freaking three two three weeks it was crazy. And um, and I relapsed, chose to relapse again, and then I, so that's led me to meeting you. Was and I mean, and that was like 2018 or 19. You know, I started learning my way around Queen Anne and Capitol Hill, and you know, either I'd sometimes I'd panhandle, sometimes I would um, dump, get high on meth and dumpster dive. I mean, I would just you were scavenging get high and scavenge, and yeah, um, and eventually, because I still, I wouldn't even, I didn't even like to steal at that point because it was just, it was still that kind of line, but the line got blurrier and eventually I started boosting and, um, you know, I knew people all over. I started going to Ballard. There was the camps there and, and most of it was I'd meet people when I, because I'd travel all around to go steal from stores, you know, Target and Fred Meyers and, all, and everything. And, um. And so I'd go to different cities, like there was the Fred Myers and Ballard, and that's how I started meeting people there. Like I'd, I'd go and um, get a little bit of dope and um, a bunch of, like steal a bunch of food, and then I'd go and hang out at Aaron and Doc's tent and um, chill with them for a couple of days. And I know when I met you, you were pretty, you were pretty, it seemed like you were pretty low at that point as well. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing I remember you doing that I thought was beautiful was um, you asked me to call your mom, <laughs> yeah, and just just say hi, 
and mm -hmm. and I did, and I appreciated that quite a bit because I really enjoyed getting to talk to your mom during that time as well. And is that what were your thoughts and feelings during during that time? You know, I I really love my parents. They are amazing, and um, I during that time on the street there was uh, lots of long periods of not being in touch and you know them not knowing if I was alive or dead you know there'd be times where I would just sit and cry thinking about them or you know I'd have really low points where I would just uh, miss them and, and, I, and I felt so like it was such an impossible distance to um, get back to them you know it, I didn't think that they would disown me but I felt like you know I, I don't even want to I wouldn't even want to go back and uh put them through seeing me seeing me or i was just a like the like the prodigal son i was just so um deep in my my stuff and and yeah I, but there would be those points where i would just i would miss them and i and i know that they love me and I, they'd miss me i either either you have a really um you have a way of getting to people's heart you know or you like you rex like you want to know you know, what is driving, you know, what, what's hurting you or what's, uh, like, I think you asked, so what's your situation or something like that. And I, um, I probably just open right up ab about it. And so I don't know if I just came out with her, you said, you know, where, do you, where's your family? And, you know, and I, uh, I remember saying, you know, I'm, I'm isolating from them or something along those lines. You know, I, I don't want to I don't remember if you said what's to stop you from calling him or if you said is there anything I can do for you and I said just call my mom and um just I think that I wanted to let her know that I love her and I was alive but I didn't want to tell her myself you know because it hurt too bad. I want to pause for a moment to give emphasis to the fact that each person's story of addiction has its own journey. While there are recovery programs and support systems there is no such thing as one size fits all. There are no formulaic solutions for the addict to just heal or get better, nor is there a paint by numbers guidance for family and friends. What worked for one person or one family doesn't necessarily mean it will work for the next. There are simply too many variables. In the best scenario, it is a process of discovery for everyone, learning, and adjusting as you go, holding on to hope and leaning into love. For Connell, his journey has been a profound one, both for him and his family. His parents and sisters have been pushed to the edge of emotional exhaustion with worry, guilt, and love. I asked them to reflect on how they coped through all the years of Connell's addiction. Well, I gotta say that um, without the spiritual side of things, I would have been totally lost. If I thought that he could die, which he could have many times, and I and there was no other thing than a dead body, then I would have been so heartbroken I couldn't have carried on. But I believe that there's love, and it's more powerful than anything on the earth that we get to see, and it's supernatural. And I believe that even if Connell died. God loved me so much that he would take care of him. And that was a day-by-day -day meditative knowledge that I had that got me through it. And it also helped me sort through the things that I had done that I could say there would have been a better way if I'd done it differently and not blame myself and not hate myself and have a peace as I would was walking through it for a long time. When we got phone calls at night, Mary's take on it was a little different than mine, although it came down to the same thing that I lived in a fear that the phone calls would become identify the body of your son. I can do practically nothing about what my boy's doing or what's happening in his life, but I'm just going to have to leave him in God's hands because he's God's child. He's my child also, but there's there's something much bigger going on here than I even understand. When we were sorting through our stuff, every once in a while we would hear from Connell, 
And always it would be, oh, I'm so sorry for what I'm putting you through. And after a while, we started to say, you don't have to apologize to us anymore. You made mistakes, we made mistakes. You don't have to hold any blame as far as we're concerned. We're doing fine, and we love you, and we just want you to make it. And I hope and I think that that somehow freed him enough to start reaching back. When I went to see him once several years ago on, on for Christmas, and I took him a present, and he was living in a, in a crummy little motel on, on uh, Aurora. When I saw him, it's the first time I'd seen him for, it seems like a couple of years. And he was about the size of a twig. When we embraced it, like I had to reach around him twice, it broke my heart. That was probably the hardest part of, the, of it, was, was seeing my boy in that condition. And no one, or thinking I was just about helpless, I'd given up on the fact that, that I've done everything I know to do. And I placed him in, in, in my creator's hands in the sense that, Lord, he's yours. I don't know what to do. I'm willing to do, but I don't know what to do. So, you know, but uh, that, that, was, that was really hard. And as the years went on, and I, I never lost the fear of getting the phone call. And dads, any dads will listen to this. If you're going through it, man, I feel for you because it, it hurts. It's, yeah, don't fall into the trap of, oh, you betrayed me. You've stolen from me. You lied to me. Those things are, are very possibly true. You know, in my case, it was true. And I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to even believe it. No, my boy wouldn't do that. You know, and, our, and friends who offered unasked for advice. And we got, so we were telling them, you got any ideas? Share your ideas. Nobody ever shared an idea that we hadn't already tried. Don't allow hate or the idea of vengeance or you're going to get it when you get home or everybody goes through hard times. It sounds kind of an inept thing to say, but everybody goes through hard times. Life's tough. Life's tough. And it hurts. But it also is so much joy and so much goodness can happen. And keep living. I would say keep praying for your child, but keep living. Don't dwell in it. It's easy to say there's a lot of words now, but, but uh, when we went through it, I think that's exactly what ended up happening. We, his mom and I shared together, we talked about it, we cried together, we were afraid together. You know, For those of you who have mates that are, are with you, you're together and you've got children that are in trouble, um, remember you're a team. Don't blame the wife. Wife, don't blame the husband, which happens all too often. Be a team. Build a strong team if you don't already have one. The, the really, the kind of crazy thing about how I started feeling like I could face my family was, you know, I started, I started like, when I, when I'd steal clothes to sell, I started keeping clothes and I started dressing, carrying a toothbrush and trying to get showered and and I I was feeling less and less like a dirty person or like a dirt like um like how the people you know the people who are going to work on third and pike would walk by and like be like ugh you know they'd kind of I mean they'd try to avoid us or me or you know um them yeah exactly and that's I mean I who can blame you know and so I stopped viewing myself like I think some people viewed me. People that were around me, my, my friends that were using and in those parts of town, they started mentioning that and were like, dude, Connell, you're changed a lot, man. You are not like, you are not the weird tweaker kid you were a couple of years ago. You know, you, you were really carrying yourself differently and... and what, they, what do you attribute that to? How did you... How did well, you... I think I was growing to the point where I, I was honest with myself and I was starting to care about myself more, but I was still in this cycle of, of using all the time and, and supporting the habit, but it was, it was inwardly I was changing and growing. You know, I was just turned 30. I feel like it stemmed from me stealing clothes and actually instead of selling them all and wearing the rags that I was wearing, it, it is like I started to view myself like I could be 
Yeah, better you know, than this. Yeah, that. And it, and the people around me, you know, noticing it and people started asking me like, why are you even out here, dude? And I was, I was talking about my family more and uh, they're like, what's, they're like, dude, if I had a family to go back to, man, what the, fu what the fuck is wrong with you, man? Like they, you could go back to your family right now. And I'd be like, well, I don't know if I could go back, but you know, they want me to, they, 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 they say they miss me and they care about me and stuff. We don't like a lot of, like a lot of my friends, they didn't have that or they lost that or they, their family was on drugs too, or they had damaged their family so much that the family had given up. I called my mom and I was just breaking down crying, saying I miss him and I love him and I'm, I'm, I'm still using, you know, I'm, I've been using this whole time, I, you know, and they, they, of course they knew, but, you know, it was just me being able to be honest with them, with, and with myself, um, about Seem, stuff. Seems like a really big step. Yeah, and I don't know, I mean, it was just, like, my, I don't know, my ego had been stripped away, my, you know, I was, it, it was like, there's the rock bottom, like, where you're just, people say, oh, I was rock bottom, I was using harder than ever, but. I was like spiritually and mentally and physically rock bottom. Like I, there wasn't, I didn't feel like I had anything left to cling to. I, there was a couple calls to my mom and, that I, um, and my dad that I just wanted to call and say, I loved him and I'm, and I miss him and I'm sorry. Yeah. I and mean, then they'd always just say, you know, we love you too. And we're glad you're safe. And, uh, we want you in our lives and, you know, some of the calls started there wasn't crying every time it was it was just saying you know i call and say you know i'm okay i love you guys before right before christmas i had i said hey uh you know i feel like i could come and you know just say you guys for christmas or i had a friend jamie who uh had a job and a car and and i asked her to come to take me to my family's house for christmas and i didn't have any i didn't think past the uh, two days or whatever, a day or two. I, I picked up a couple Suboxone. I had like a gram of, of heroin or like a half gram of heroin or something, which is like I mean, less than a day's worth. Um, and so I went, came to my sister Katie's house and all my, you know, my parents and sisters were there and brother-in-laws and, uh, you know, we had dinner and, you know, I was in pretty rough shape. And so Katie talked to the, my, the family and, um, was she, I think she said, uh, so you're miserable on the street. And I was like, yes, I'm very miserable. You know, I'm still using every day. I'm still to support my habit. I'm on the street. And uh, she said, okay, so, and you'd be miserable clean, right? And I said, yeah, I'd be extremely miserable. And she said, well, why don't you try being miserable here for a little while, you know, instead of being miserable out there and see how it goes. Just try. I didn't, I didn't want to assume that they would just, t I mean, I, it didn't even cross my mind that this would happen. I just wanted to see him. So I just said yes. And uh, I, they, my parents had a room here, actually, in, in the uh, guest bedroom. I think I had like five or six of Suboxone. And uh, Katie, my sister, took me off island to a Suboxone clinic. And then I just started taking Suboxone. And uh, I was in bed for like a month or a month and a half. And then I I slept all the time for months after that um I, I think about five months in i i was ready to get a job and you know it's been two years now um well over two years <laughs> and if i can do it i think i really think anyone can do it i was a hope to die addict you know it's awesome i mean i if i don't i don't know if i could have done it if i hadn't had the support or i don't know if i would have had could have had the you know, the courage to care about myself if I hadn't have been raised by the people I was raised by. I mean, because I, I was taught stuff my whole life, you know, taught really things to live by and to love each other and to protect women and children and everybody. And, and that includes protecting people from yourself. You know, what unconditional love is and grace. That stuff stayed. It didn't go in one ear out the other. Like, I retained a lot of that stuff. And it's a lot of it stuck with me throughout the time I was on the street, you know. I um I mean, I wasn't a, a saint by any means. I've I've stolen from my friends and I've I've checked car door handles like it was always really against it, but I but there was times where I, I you know, I let myself you know, steal change out of people's cars. You know, when I hear you share about, you know, your 
your story and about your convictions and the things you were taught and um, and it rings true you're anybody that would sit with you for five minutes would know what a good person you are I mean it's really easy to see easy to feel actually I felt it when I saw your head pop out of that tent the first time and we started talking and like you just have a an energy or an aura whatever you want to say whatever your language is that you have a way about you that it's easy to see and feel that you're a good man it makes me think about how powerful drugs are to take that down, right? Like to actually to subvert all that and push you into a period of time of what, how, 10 years or? Yeah, I mean. Or longer? Yeah, about. 15. 15. I mean, yeah. I'd say a solid, a solid 13 of, yeah. you know, with, with a couple breaks. And what would you, because what it makes, it reminds me again to not judge right like you're a good man and you got you got to, you got sidetracked for 13 years i think about all the people that are on the street just all having their own story and struggling with their own journey i mean is that an insight that you share or that you even can expand on because you were there like you can't really be a true friend when you're serving yourself in that manner you know but there's people that I met out there I still think about and I still talk to some of them. A lot of, a lot of my friends from there have gotten clean and I've, had, and I've had friends that came from great place, you know, great upbringings that passed away. They used so much either from overdoses or just from, you know, you get, you shoot up using dirty needles for so long that your, your, your blood gets sicker and sicker to the point where you just, you know, your, your organs fail and it is just a really, really strong beast. I say it all the time, it takes people from all walks of life. Everybody has their own story and that judging, coming up with a, with like, oh, they're probably just these malicious monsters that they're not, they're not using because they're, they have pain, they're using because they want, they want to go out and hurt people. It's just so easy to make a, your own reason or, you know, there's no way that they could, they could have story or struggle or their own feelings are there. I mean, tons of the people out there that I met were really sweet, sweet-hearted people. And probably at least a third of them have passed away. Yeah. There's too many stories like that. I always feel like uh, those moments are, we've got it wrong, like, like the people that are really struggling in the worst of their moments, we tend to shun and almost kick the dog when it's down. And it, it seems like it should be the exact opposite, right? Like um, rather than push away, pull closer because they're struggling so much, mm -hmm. right? And that may not always be the answer, but I think when I listen to your story, for instance, knowing that your parents loved you, your sisters love you, that that was always there once you were done working through your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. and, I feel like everybody should have that opportunity, right, to come back to a, a love center, yeah. you know, to, to help work through it. it. Seems like it's closer to the truth, if there's a truth in this, because I know it's a varied journey for everybody, but it seems like one of the constants is just loving, just accepting and loving and seeing. It can be hard to love yourself if no one else shows you that you can be loved, if, they, if no one else loves you. Like, like you reminded me that I mean, that I have a family that loved me and that, you know, you, you cared about me and, and at times where I would just was completely on the side of believing, thinking of myself how other, other people would perceive me, you know, believe in the self lies and stuff. And um, it can be really hard to get out of that mindset if, you know, you don't have someone to remind you. Connell knows he's fortunate to be where he is now. Somehow, through all the craziness, he was able to dig deep within himself, along with a great deal of love and support from family and friends, to find a way to free himself from drugs. Being with him, you can hear it in his voice and see it in the way he presents himself. He's not the same struggling kid that popped his head out of the tent four years ago when we first met. There is now a bright light, a strength and humility to him that's really beautiful. 
Being off drugs for well over two years, Connell's life has moved forward. For over a year, he has been employed as an apprentice plumber. It's like he found his calling. He's got the perfect boss and just loves his job. Every little thing about it, including the tight spots in crawl spaces. He's also back playing drums with two bands and just moved into his own home. Maybe most importantly, Connell is back being close with his family, feeling like he fits in, no longer a black sheep. Before I left the Millers, I wanted to ask for some advice for other families that are struggling right now. One thing that I don't know if this is gonna be helpful or not to other families, but if there's smoke or if you think, the answer's yes. If they have told you they're clean, but you have this feeling of like, uh, they're not. <laughs> if, well, if, you, if you're confused, they're lying. If you're confused, they're lying. And that doesn't mean you need to be mad or treat them mm -mm. bad. It just helps us. Yeah. Like, wait a minute, this doesn't make, you know, if I start feeling confused. Yeah, I knew, and I knew with Connell, and I remember telling my husband and maybe telling my parents that um, I'll know when he's clean, when he stops talking. And it was true. When he came home and he had made the decision and there was just not a whole lot of words and all the times previous to that, it was just motor mouth telling you all the things he was doing great and all the ways he was staying clean and just motor mouthing the whole time. So, um, and it was true. When you came home and you had made that decision, there wasn't a whole lot of talking. It was hard to get you to talk at all. There's things that you're gonna find that you can hang on to. Like there's this um, old Bible verse that says, who are we to make straight what God has made crooked? That idea that everybody has their own road and there's a purpose and there's a reason. The thing that kept me going was knowing Connell, knowing how kind he was and knowing that I didn't have what it took to be kind to people that were dirty. I mean, physically dirty. And he did. And he, he was able to be kind to people that I couldn't. If you're a family member or you have a loved one that's living on the streets or living with addiction or has burned their bridges with you for right now, like, hang on to the good things you know. And honestly, really, truly, honestly, never give up hope. Because the second I started to give up hope. The second I thought, I just want to see him one more time before he dies, that's when I started building a wall between me and him because it was too painful. I do want to say for people, if somebody hasn't said this before on a podcast or in a group meeting or something, that when somebody is getting clean, let them have as much candy as they want, yes. as much Mountain Dew as they yes. want. Let them have as much sleep as they want. It's gonna take six months to a year to get their sleeping patterns under control. Do not worry that it's a bad habit that has to be broken. When they're clean, when they're not using uh, intravenous drugs, uh, don't do tough love. <laughs> when they're not using intravenous drugs anymore, that's when you need to just they're home, they're safe, they're not stealing, they're fine. Because Connell used for a long time and it took his, all of his nerve endings and his neurons and his taste buds, it took him a long time for those to get back to normal. And so please don't do like a military clean the room out, why do you have those candy wrappers in there? Like just keep on, hold on tightly to the fact they're not using, they're not having drug seeking behaviors. Um, so eyes on the prize, don't worry about cavities. Yeah. Amen. Well, because he literally lived on candy for six months. And he played video games all night, you yeah. know, and who cares? Yeah. Yeah, he slept a lot of the day. And uh, we kept, uh, as mom and dad, do we start uh, encouraging him to get a job? And I kept saying no. No, 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 no. 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 And thank God for that. Because yeah. I don't know if we would have known what to do next. Because sleeping all day did not seem like the right thing for him to do. The one thing that I realized that you're hoping that there is sort of this package that we could give people and say, here's how to do it. But there is no package. You've got to listen to yourself and your own body. And 
even if that leads to a terrible mistake, like enabling or, or giving them money and then having them get high off of it and, and ODing or something, you're still moving forward. And my, uh, my bottom line philosophy is knowing what Putin's doing, knowing what's going on with COVID, knowing that there's kids that are being trafficked, it's not that I don't know all of that stuff is in the world. I know it's there. But the only thing I can do is the next good thing. And that's my philosophy. And I was telling that to a person who said, well, then I want to go with you. And I said, OK, but you know what? The next good thing is I'm going to kiss you goodbye. That's all it is. I'm going to give you a kiss on the cheek and say goodbye. It's just that simple. Yeah. With these people that are facing their child on the street and they know they can't do anything, is there somebody that they can do and not the next good thing to? We were held up and supported by our six grandkids that are here on the island and our two daughters while Connell was hurting and we couldn't do anything about it. But we just did the next good thing. You Know Me Now is produced, written, and edited by Tomas Bernatsky and me, Rex Holbein. We would like to give a heartfelt thanks to Connell and his family, Steve, Mary, Bridie, and Katie, for inviting us into their home and for the opportunity to get to know them. The music you're hearing now is Pondering Distortion. Connell plays the drums, Aaron is on bass, and Pauline on guitar and vocals. Connell also plays in the band called All We Have Is Now. You Know Me Now has a Facebook page where you can join the conversation and a website at www.youknowmenow.com where you can see photos of Connell and his family as well as read other stories of folks we feel you should get to know. Under the episode page, we included links to Connell's two bands as well as some Pacific Northwest resources for families in similar situations, as well as a few organizations in Seattle where you can donate or volunteer at. In our busy lives, let's not forget to take the time to get off our own path to help someone struggling with theirs. 